Hello and welcome to All About the Ancient World. Our channel is dedicated to promoting the voices of early queer researchers in studies of the ancient world. This presentation is titled About Face, Female Frontality in the Course About Ivories. It focuses on the role of female frontality, gender, and composite creatures, and the unstable meanings of the Course About Ivy Sphinxes in a cross-cultural context. It is presented by Rafaela Brosnan. Rafaela Brosnan is currently the John Wilmerding Intern for Digital Interpretation at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. She earned her master's degree with specializations in Ancient Near Eastern Art and Archaeology and Curatorial Studies from the University of Chicago in 2020. Since then, she has held internships with the Penn Museum and the Metropolitan Museum of Art and worked as a museum educator. Raphael's research interests include gender and sexuality in the ancient world, displaced objects, and social justice in the museum field. Now, without further ado, please enjoy this presentation all about the ancient world. Hi, I'm Rafaela Brosnan, and today I'll be presenting on female frontality as displayed by the ivory sphinxes from Khorsabad. We will explore new interpretations regarding their use and significance in the ancient city, and through this examination, I will discuss some of the problems with current frameworks for analyzing foreign ivories in Assyrian contexts, and put forth other directions for further study. So first, some history and context. We'll be referencing a few primary locations, namely Damascus in southwestern Syria, Nimrud, a city in northern Iraq that used to be the Assyrian city of Kalu, and Khorsabad, also in northern Iraq and formerly the ancient city of Dur Sharkin. Kalu and Dur Sharkin were both once capitals of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire refers to a prominent Mesopotamian civilization that began as a city state in the 21st century BCE and became a major empire in 14th century BCE that lasted until the 7th century BCE. The period between 911 and 609 is typically referred to as the Neo-Assyrian period, and this is when the empire reached its peak. It was during this time that Kalu was the capital from 884 until 706, when King Sargon II moved it to Dur Sharkin. Sargon II ruled from 722 to 705 BCE, and the empire reached the extent shown on this map during his reign. So let's move to some more recent history. Since the 1840s, thousands of ancient ivories have been excavated at several sites throughout the modern day countries of Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. The largest hoard of ivories was found in Nimrud. In examining this massive group of ivories, it became clear from their artistic styles that they were foreign. So archeologists hoped that by studying their appearance and forms, they could identify the people who originally made them before they came to the Assyrian site. So let's take a look at some of those. Now, based on common Egyptian elements and motifs in many of the ivories, as you can see here, they were originally misidentified as Egyptian in origin. But a later archaeologist, R.D. Barnett, determined that those that look Egyptian with more slender and finer modeling were likely Phoenician, like the one you can see on the left, while others with rounder features and wider proportions were North Syrian as with the one on the right. But not everything fully fit into those broad categories. So in 1981, art historian Irene Winter proposed that there is a third major grouping as represented by this middle sphinx, which she called South Syrian, and that might come from Damascus. This group has also been called intermediate or Syro-Phoenician because it could be thought of as an integrated combination of Phoenician and North Syrian elements, executing Phoenician style compositions in slightly broader proportions with a fuller use of space as with the North Syrian ivories. In that regard, British archeologist Georgina Herman has then proposed that Syro-Phoenician ivories are Syrian renderings of Phoenician originals made by Aramean communities in Southern Syria. Some scholars have even analyzed the stylistic minutiae of the ivories to classify them into smaller subgroupings. Broadly, this is the foundation of how these ivories are treated in the field today, but it is important to note that no excavations have found substantial evidence of systematic large-scale ivory production at Phoenician sites or in Syria, meaning that none of these attributions can really be verified at the moment. So I posit in that case that it is more productive to focus on where and how these ivories were received and used instead of where they originated. To do that, I'm going to focus on a subgrouping, um, the so-named wig and wing subgrouping, a classification of Syro-Phoenician ivory carvings. This sphinx in the center with its 
beaded wig, elaborate wings, and a frontal feminine face is part of that group. While the largest hoard of ivories was excavated at Nimrud, as I stated, a smaller collection of wig and wing ivories dating to the 9th and 8th centuries BCE have been identified at the modern city of Kord Sabad, which, as I said, used to be ancient Dershar Kin. These ivories were excavated in the 1930s during the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute's excavations of ancient Dershar Kin, uh, which, as I noticed previously, was the Assyrian capital under King Sargon from 706 to 705 BCE, so a small window, and that was after it was moved from Kalu. Among these ivories are a set of elaborate expressive sphinxes measuring about less than five inches tall and about four inches wide, so not too large. The naturalistic bases of these sphinxes are so striking because they really stare out at the viewer. The head is emphasized by this woven wig and its patterned collar, and this visual emphasis really calls attention to the feminine and frontal nature of their faces. This phenomenon of female frontality, as displayed by these sphinxes, is relatively unexplored in ancient Near Eastern art more generally, and its prominence in the wig and wing subgrouping of ivory carving is definitely intriguing. So Syrian Phoenician ivories are generally noted for their similarities to Phoenician compositions. However, while Phoenician ivory sphinxes do definitely share a similar striding stance, though I apologize, it may be difficult to see that in their fragmented states. Uh, Phoenician sphinxes are typically rendered in profile and they nearly always wear this headdress called a mamies and an Egyptian double crown, as you can see here. The wig and wing ivory sphinxes are then distinctive for their frontal gaze, the striking pose, and their feminine faces. So I argue that these features constitute an original adaptation that distinguishes these sphinxes from previous models. So to explore this idea, we'll continue discussing their formal features and the potential cultural associations or symbolic significance that these specific sphinxes could have had in ancient Dershar Kim. Now, unlike Nimrud, where excavations uncovered thousands of ivories, fewer than 50 fragmented ivories were recovered at Korsabad, and most were concentrated in one area of the site, where the city's temple to the god Nabu once stood. Nabu is the Mesopotamian god of wisdom, and he was considered an especially important figure during the Neo-Assyrian period. Uh, the 28 ivories uncovered in the temple comprise 15 frontal sphinxes, nine ivories with what we call the woman in the window motif as shown on the left, and three panels with standing figures as well as a single sphinx who is in profile. Most Levantine ivories found at Neo-Assyrian sites are panels that were once attached to wooden furniture, and those found in the Nabu temple are all consistent in terms of style, size, and iconography, suggesting that they may have constituted a single item of furniture. So between all of these ivory pieces, this item would have had a remarkable number of frontally rendered feminine faces, which definitely would have stood out against the comparative lack of female frontality visible in Neo-Assyrian art from the same time. At one point, it was assumed that the foreign ivories at new Assyrian sites would have been piled in storerooms after they were obtained as tribute or booty, but textual records indicate that the ivories were highly valued in the Assyrian context, and they were actually utilized for luxury furniture in the Assyrian court. Depictions of foreign ivory show it in an Assyrianized style, as we'll explore later, and this tells us that foreign objects become Assyrian in a, in a sense, and they were incorporated into the site for specific decorative or even useful purposes. While we don't know exactly how these ivories were used, comparisons to Nimrud do suggest that they could have comprised an ivory throne in the Nabu Temple's throne room. In the throne room of Nimrud's Nabu Temple, excavators did recover in situ a collection of Assyrian ivories that were once attached to a throne. They present an interesting parallel to those from ancient Dershar Kin because excavators found two feminine ivory heads carved in the round at Nimrud, uh, suggesting a presence of female frontality in the throne room there. Now, at Dershur Kin, in contrast, no ivories and no throne were actually found within the throne room, but the grouping of these ivories suggests that they could have been used in the Nabu Temple's throne room and later dropped in a passageway when the site was hurriedly abandoned in 705 BCE. Now, during Sargon II's reign, the Nabu Temple was definitely a very important building. It stood separately from the site's other temples, and it's the only temple that would have had a throne room. 
When he designed the plan for the citadel at ancient Dur Sharkin, he included a personal access bridge that connected his palace to the temple directly, suggesting an unprecedentedly intimate relationship between Sargon and the god Nabu. Now, because Nabu was so important during this time, his domains of wisdom and specialized knowledge were also prioritized. The ivory's presence within such a significant space tells us that they held value and meaning, and they may have been related to the power and wisdom that Nabu represented. So with this relationship to Dur Sharkin and the Nabu temple in mind, let's, let's explore the frontality of the sphinxes. Even though they are small, as I said, their frontal gaze would have been eye-catching, drawing the viewer in and inviting visual, emotional, or even tactile interaction. As you look at them, they look back at you, establishing a humanizing bond that can really augment one's visual experience by engaging the viewer within the composition. There's not much action here, so the emphasis is on the face and on the act of looking itself. In this way, vision is a social phenomenon that emphasizes the relationship between the viewer and who or what they are looking upon. In ancient Mesopotamia, vision was associated with emotionally significant occasions or locations in literature and art. Consider, for example, Sumerian votive figures like this one on the left, whose massive eyes are connected to the act of continuous prayer and worship. Similarly, the sphinxes and the woman in the window compositions have brow, broad, rounded eyes that are emphasized through deep incisions. When we take into account the importance of looking, these types of artwork have the potential to intensify the viewer's emotional reaction to or intellectual consideration of the object through its bold stare. In addition to the cathectic and affective nature of looking, vision also has an intimate relationship with scholarly and artistic knowledge in Neo-Syrian Neo culture, which is, establishes an even stronger connection to the god Nabu. Nabu, the god of wisdom and writing, is often associated with scholarship and craftsmanship in Neo-Syrian literature. Intriguingly, these realms of knowledge can also be linked to accessibility and privileged vision, which is demonstrated in the Nabu Temple's architectural plan. A series of courtyards and chambers, as you can see here on this chart and map, limited access to portions of the temple, uh, creating conditions of restricted visibility as sections were often blocked by walls or required one to maneuver around corners. This was partly to control physical and visual access to important ritual objects in cult rooms, as well as scholarly records held in the inner chambers. The throne room suite specifically, which are rooms 42 and 39 on this plan that I've highlighted, uh, is characterized by a bent access orientation, which requires entrance to change orientation once inside the room. This arrangement means that one cannot see the short end of the throne room where the throne would be located before entering. Only those permitted to physically enter the room would be able to view the throne. In this way, limited visual access, whether it's the ability to read a document or see an object, accompanied the privilege and specialized knowledge that was associated with Nabu. The act of looking implied by the frontal faces of the Sphinx ivories and their potential presence within a restricted portion of the Nabu temple at Dersharkin becomes all the more significant within this architectural context, alongside the suggestion that their frontal gaze became referential to the specialized knowledge and wisdom embodied by Nabu and his temple. The value of the gaze and the symbolic importance of the face is further attested in Neo-Syrian royal inscriptions, which were carved into the walls of temples and palaces. One such inscription, as I've shown here, is carved into the walls of multiple thresholds in Dersharkin's Nabu temple, which demonstrates Sargon's piety to the god. It reads in part, O Nabu, look steadily with firm heart and direct your just face towards him. The inscription uses the Sumerogram Iggy Bar, which in this case likely stands for the verb Naplusu, an imperative form of to look that became popularized during Sargon's reign. It typically accompanies a plea for the divine gaze, as it does here, demonstrating how essential this divine gaze is to Neo-Assyrian rulers. Additionally, the request that Nabu direct his face towards Sargon speaks to the centrality of the face as it relates to the act of looking. Though the course about ivories were not created at Dershurikin, it becomes increasingly likely that they held a place of some importance and 
acquired a symbolic relationship to the gaze and privileged looking that were important features of the Nabu temple under Sargon. Now, frontality as a whole play, um, plays a huge role at Durshurikin as a compositional motif, furthering the notion that frontality and the gaze were especially significant under Sargon, who was responsible for the overall design of the capital city. The site features several colossal figures in frontal poses, most notably the Lamassu, which I've shown on the left here. These are massive winged bulls with human heads that served as divine guardian figures. Their faces look boldly out to stare down whoever approaches, but their calm expressions, striding poses, and gently upturned wings draw a compelling visual comparison to the small, delicate ivory sphinxes that we're discussing. The pose is actually so consistent that archaeologist Max Mallowin has referred to it as a technique attributable to Sargon. In another instance, he actually refers to an ivory sphinx in this pose as a Lamassu. There are clear similarities between the colossal Lamassu and the ivory sphinxes, but the Lamassu as guardian figures are thought to stand this way in order to intimidate anyone who approaches the, the city. In contrast, the diminutive of sphinxes are unlikely to be seen as physically imposing in any impactful way, despite their confidently staring faces. And this suggests that further investigation is still necessary to fully understand their potential connotations and effects within the context of the Nabu temple. So in addition to their frontality, the sphinxes from Darshar Kin also differ from the more traditional male sphinxes that precede them in their gender presentation. In contrast, uh, the long woven wigs worn by the wig and wing sphinxes are markedly feminine and they have softer facial features that most scholars have interpreted as feminine as well. In comparison to Phoenician and Assyrian males, the faces of the Dershar Kin sphinxes are distinctively female presenting and they establish yet another divergence from the Phoenician ivories in that way. Furthermore, the ivory's presence in Dersharkin stands in stark contrast to the disproportionate representation of women in Neo-Assyrian artwork. So the femininity of these ivories definitely would have stood out. The Neo-Assyrian court valued and likely used foreign ivories, including those with frontal uh, females, which were likely kept in part as souvenirs or proof of military victory. In addition to evidence that the Nimrud ivories were displayed and engaged with as noted above, Records, descriptions, and even depictions of ivory furniture taken as booty or tribute indicate that foreign ivories had a rhetorical and social value within the Neo-Assyrian court. Neo-Assyrian depictions of ivory furniture, such as reliefs, are typically stylistically Assyrianized, but historical documentation indicates that these scenes likely represent foreign objects. One such, one such example appears in the well-known garden scene relief from Nineveh, the Assyrian capital after Dershar King was abandoned, and it depicts the Assyrian king and queen sitting on furniture after the defeat of Elam. The chair, table, and couch here match descriptions of furniture with ivory fittings, and the scenery also illustrates the foreign site of the military victory. Intriguingly, the couch and chair atop which the king and queen rely recline bear images of what appear to be long-haired, frontally oriented women. So let me show you a detail of that. Uh, while some scholars have proposed that these figures on the left are beardless eunuchs, they bear more resemblance to the women at the window motif rendered in an Assyrian manner. Um, and on the left, you can actually see that the box uh, that's on the table in the scene also has sphinxes very similar to the ones that we're looking at, also with longer hair, though it is difficult to tell whether or not they are posed um, in profile or frontally. Overall, the garden relief indicates at least a visual presence of these designs at Nineveh, and it demonstrates that female frontality may have had a conspicuous presence in the Neo-Assyrian court. Now, the notion that a Neo-Assyrian audience would have appreciated ivories with female frontality is also supported by the beauty standards held in the Neo-Assyrian court. As the Assyrian Empire at this time stretched west to the Venetian coast, like I showed in the map earlier, the Neo-Assyrian court had access to a variety of Levantine luxury goods, and Assyrian elites would have even taken Levantine wives. When combined with the fact that depictions of Levantine women adorned the ivories owned by new Assyrian royalty, it is clear that the ivories resonate with Assyrian concepts of beauty. The prominent heads, exaggerated eyes, and detailed hair of the Levantine ivories, the Dershar Kin ivories included, 
they embody a cross-cultural, um, the cross-cultural features of idealized beauty. These descriptions are consistent with Assyrian love lyrics and with the conventions used to depict women in the few Neo-Assyrian examples that we have. The Neo-Assyrian court likely valued Levantine ivories with depictions of women, not only for the value of the ivories themselves, but also because they align with and to an extent may have even influenced Assyrian beauty standards. This cross-cultural appreciation of female frontality is perhaps best demonstrated through the prominence of the woman at the window motif that I've mentioned a few times. Um, it is identified in all the major Levantine ivory carving traditions found at Nimrud. And in addition to the 15 frontal sphinxes in Dur Kin, nine of the ivories are woman at the window motifs. Visually, a comparison can definitely be drawn between the female frontality of both the sphinxes and the, woman, the women at the window. The woman at the window ivories bear similar facial features and long hair like the sphinxes, and they're stylistically congruent as well. The female frontality of both motifs likely had consistent or related implications, and the woman at the window motif has been the subject of abundant iconographic study. And while not everyone agrees on the composition's symbolic significance, most agree that the common pattern would have had specific and meaningful connotations in a variety of cultural contexts. Some scholars have interpreted the woman at the window as representing the meeting of male and female at a threshold, as is described in tales of courtly love. This may have had sexual implications as well. Art historian Irene Winter, who I mentioned earlier, has also re-examined earlier analyses to suggest that the women at the window represent a powerful and affective gaze that brings atypical visibility to women and their faces, much like the sphinxes do as well. So while the faces of the sphinxes and the women at the window are feminine with soft features and markers of gender, the overall figure is still not explicitly sexual. In fact, most complete examples of wig and wing sphinxes do have the suggestion of male genitalia. It is uh, relatively common for the few depictions of Assyrian queens to be somewhat masculine in their flat-chested appearance, but the combination of explicit femininity and masculinity is somewhat unprecedented. Composite creatures like sphinxes are the perfect ground for exploring complex and fluid ideas like gender presentation and sexuality because they invite these creative subversions. Composite creatures and fragmented and fantastical, yet complete and powerful all at once. So they allow craftsmen and consumers to seamlessly combine people and monsters as well as male and female presenting features in a way um, that more straightforward subjects might resist. The sphinxes bear these intriguing patterns of androgyny, gender play, or even a dual sexuality that is as of yet unexplored in Levantine, Aramean, and Neo-Assyrian contexts. What is unclear exactly what this combination of features could have meant in a Levantine context, it also might have held a different significance in its Assyrian context of practice. And if it is the case, as I've suggested, that the Dershurkin ivories were displayed and used within the Nabu Temple's throne room, then the Sphinx's androgyny and frontality, along with the women at the window ivories, could have had a significant symbolic importance for the temple's Akitu ceremony. In Neo-Assyrian settings, the Akitu festival was an annual performance ritual celebrating the divine marriage of Nabu and his consort Tashmetu, a goddess associated with wisdom and sexual attraction. And they used this ceremony to affirm the king's legitimacy and continuing divine favor. The throne room suite of the Nabu temple was a part of this ceremony, serving as a location for the divine marriage. In this case, the dual sexuality of the sphinxes could have become referential to this ceremony in a symbolic way, representing the union of Nabu and Tashmetu of male and female. While it is not certain that these ivories were held or used in the throne room, the throne room of the Nabu temple at Nimrud not only had ivories depicting sphinxes, but also two ivory female heads carved in the round, which, as I said earlier, offers a form of female frontality that may have been involved in the Akitu festival there, so it definitely supports this idea. These examples from Nimrud serve as a precedent for the female frontality displayed by the sphinxes and the women at the window in Dershar Kin's Nabu Temple. As Dr. Virginia Herman has put it, the woman at the window motif represents the, quote, meeting of the sexes at the opening between the inner realm of women and the outer realm of men, unquote. And in, that's in the same way that a marriage may signify a gender union.
the dual gender of these sphinxes may then serve to embody this meaning of the sexes, joining male and female visually. Just as the sphinx's body joins masculine and feminine features, the female frontality acts in a similar way. Like the marriage ceremony between Nabu and Tashmetu brings together wisdom and sexuality, the female frontality of the Korsan sphinxes also serves as a visual union of those same qualities. Now, gender, frontality, and use are all exciting avenues for interpretation of many of the Levantine ivories found in Neo-Assyrian contexts. But what can this project tell us about Syro-Phoenician ivories more broadly? Well, I argue that it provides an alternative framework, an alternative to the frameworks of originality and hybridity that dominate the studies of ivory classifications. As I described earlier, a leading theory about the origin of Syro-Phoenician ivories is that they are copies and adaptations of Phoenician originals. In general, the use of certain compositions, motifs, and details like sh the shape of flowers or patterns of clothing um, support this claim. And British archaeologist Georgina Herman does argue that this practice of adopting and adapting motifs would be a way for Aramean communities in what is now southern Syria to establish independent state identities through art. Um, this adaptation and manipulation of pre-existing imagery would be an easy way for growing states to quickly assert their own artistic tradition and its association with Phoenician art would have likely legitimized its artistic authority. Now, it is with this conclusion that most prior analyses end. But this line of reasoning places more emphasis on the ivory's geographic origins rather than focusing on their most salient visual characteristics. While the ivories do present adaptations to an extent, they ultimately distinguish themselves through transformational changes like their female presenting frontality. Furthermore, to view these ivories as solely emulating Phoenician originals disregards the relationship to Neo-Assyrian contexts. The frontal gaze and effeminate features of the Dershark and ivories may have been especially desirable to Sargon at that time. The presence of furniture covered with wig and wing ivories in a place of importance, like the Nabu Temple, indicates that these ivories were valued for their own merits. With their bold pose and confronting gaze, the Dershark and ivories afforded opportunities for interaction that were not possible with the Phoenician ivories that are rendered in profile. In all probability, the new Assyrian royal court valued these ivories for their own qualities rather than their relationship to Phoenician art. Whatever the setting, their frontality and femininity allowed them to take on meanings that diverge from those that a Phoenician profile sphinx may have. These ivories do not simply borrow from Phoenician originals. Through their innovations, they become original works of art capable of evoking emotion and specific associations that differ from their Phoenician counterparts. We cannot thoroughly interpret these ivories when we solely focus on their relationship to Phoenician models. It is more productive to explore what purpose or connotations the striding sinx is held in their local context or as part of ancient Dersha or kin than it is to attempt to understand these ivories as primarily mobilizing Phoenician conventions. So as a whole, the South Syrian or Syro-Phoenician group of ivories was originally described as a combination of Phoenician and North Syrian compositions and stylistic features. The conceptualization of the Syro-Phoenician group as a hybrid style is part of the reason that it is difficult to recognize the distinct characteristics and innovations made in these works. Hybridity can be a valuable lens through which to approach art because it calls attention to the social interactions that style can reflect. Defining visual hybridity as the visible and recognizable blending of cultural imagery, it can also be a way to describe the visual impact of shared styles and imagery, pointing to the interaction between multiple communities. While the term hybrid can have negative connotations or imply a lesser value of the work, a negative valuation is not inherent in the notion of visually blending cultural imagery. Rather, visual hybridity can indicate the positive and intentional interactions of people from different cultures. However, this perspective only provides information, again, about the production of these works. The consumption and contextual significance of Sphinx ivories found at ancient Dershar Kin cannot be explained through the notion of hybridity because hybridity is, in a sense, unidirectional. The conception of the Syro-Phoenician style as a hybrid between Syrian and Phoenician tradition provides little information about the other interactions that these ivories may have been a part of. The focus is on the combined Phoenician and Syrian imagery rather than on these ivories themselves. 
If these differences, such as their frontal poses and feminine wigs, are emphasized over their similarities, these ivories can be seen in terms of their innovations and their relationships to other communities. Ultimately, by focusing on the ivory's unique features and their relationship to ancient Dershar kin, we can see that the female frontality significantly transforms the sphinxes, bringing to bear new questions about their gaze, their gender, and what specific connotations they may carry depending on their context of practice. Through research on these topics, I hope to create a foundation for other avenues of study of the somewhat overlooked characteristics of the course about ivories and to begin a broader conversation about the affective nature of female frontality and its role in the ancient Near East. Thank you. Thank you for watching About Face, Female Frontality in the Course About Ivories, presented by Rafaela Brosnan. If you have a question about the content of this lecture, please leave a comment below. If you liked this video and want to see more, click the subscribe button and don't forget to hit the notification bell to get updates about future videos. If you want to know more about All About the Ancient World, check out our website linked in the description below. And if you're an early career researcher and have an idea for a lecture of your own, please check out the call for papers on our website and consider applying today. Our next deadline is April 1st, 2022. We hope you enjoyed learning all about the ancient world and we'll see you in the next video.